Okay, so, they, so they're, they're relying on logical fallacies so far, and they're relying on lying about the history of science. What about this whole complexity issue, though? As I just said, we biologists we're f will freely admit things are really, really complicated inside the cell. They're even more complicated when you have some training and understand the biology, unlike most of the creationists. <laughs> so how do we explain that? Don't we have to resort to a creator? And, and, and we say, well, no, of course not. Uh, there's lots of things that are very complicated. I'll, I'll show you an example here. Uh, this is... This is a photo from a beach up north, uh, Rialto Beach in Washington State. It's one of my favorite places. I really recommend. Go ahead, take a vacation there. You'll love it. Uh, and this is a very common thing along beaches, even beaches in California. Driftwood. Have you ever looked at driftwood? You go on the beach, and uh, I, I'm sure they bulldoze it away here, but you know, in, in, in <laughs> other states, it's, it's left sitting there. Uh, you find these walls of driftwood between you and getting down to the beach. Real walls, very complicated walls. Look at all those logs just lying all over the place. This is, we can say, a wall. It has been constructed. Who did it? We know the answer. Natural processes did it. We don't need a designer to build this kind of wall. That what happens here is this is just the storm line that storms come along, they push logs that are floating at, at sea up onto the shore, and this is the limit of where they, they push them, and they pile up there, and they make these very complicated long walls that run for miles and miles and miles, and are interesting places with all kinds of bizarre things going on in them. I mean, they, these are habitats for various invertebrates, uh, for birds, all kinds of things live in here. Uh, bacteria, of course, are thriving on it, and you get these complicated shapes. This is complex. You simply can't deny it. That's a very complex thing. You know, if I, turn this, this, if I turn the projector off, will you be able to draw it? No. Because it is, it, it's fairly detailed, all kinds of minutia involved in building this kind of wall. On the other hand, we're familiar with this kind of wall. So this is also a wall. It's one that we can recognize that has a specific purpose that was built in, by, by human agents and I'd have to say that of these two walls, which one is simpler? The human-built one. This is one of the things about agency, is that when we build things, we don't make them needlessly complex. We want to make them as simple and efficient as we can, unlike that driftwood wall. So there's a difference here. When we look at natural walls, what we discover is that natural things are built by chance and necessity. They're functionally unspecified. There's, there's nothing that says that pile of driftwood is a wall. It just functions as a wall to us. But it's also got diverse other functions. And they all tend to be complex. In this sense, complex often means sloppy. <laughs> but it's still complex. Artificial walls, on the other hand, are, are built with intent. They're functionally very specific. You know, you don't, you don't just get a bunch of bricks and some mortar and you randomly throw it around to build a wall. You, if, you, if you want to build a wall, you build a wall. And that makes them relatively simple. So this is a mistake they're making, is, is, is you can't use simple complexity as a measure of design. As another example, uh, I, I know there are some academics here who are probably like me. Uh, you know, I start every school year and I go into my office and my desk is pristine and everything is neatly laid out. And if, if you want to see real complexity, come visit me around about December. And suddenly everything is overwhelmed with complexity. There's books and papers everywhere. And I, can, I, I swear to you, it's not by intent. I don't plan it that way. What it is is a lack of planning that leads to this kind of complexity. OK, what about real biology? something more interesting than a pile of driftwood. Can we find instances of complexity building up in organisms? And can we say whether it's a result of design or something else going on? And I'm just going to give you one example, because I don't want to be in the way of the beer. And this, this is one of my favorite animals. This is a coanoflagellate. Uh, coanoflagellates are, are really cool, simple little protists. So that's the first thing I have to tell you. This is a protist. It means it is typically a single-celled animal. And what it does is it just sits there in the water column, and it's got this thing called a flagellum, which the 
Creation is just love. Okay, well, there's a flagellum there, and it whips around, and what it does is gen generates vortexes of, of water currents that suck bacteria and other things that it might want to eat down toward that little collar of cells or collar of cilia that surround the flagellum. And that's how it lives. It just slurps up the water, collects all the bacteria that stick to its, its collar, and it thrives. It does very well. Uh, this is a protist, and like it says there, it's not a metazoan. And a metazoan is simply things like us, multicellular animals. I think you would all agree with me that there is a difference in complexity between a protist and a metazoan, right? Okay, because if, if, if you're going to disagree with me, I'd have to stop and we'd have to lecture for an hour to explain this. <laughs> And that will get in the way of the beer, but I, so I won't. So anyway, we've, we're multicellular animals. What does that mean? That means we are made up of collections of cells, large collections of cells that have to do multiple things, messages back and forth, basically telling each other what they're supposed to do. So you can imagine, for instance, there, you know, uh, there are messages flying around uh, when you eat a candy bar. Insulin, you've all heard of that. We've got to have this stuff that's flowing around that tells cells whether it's okay to take up sugars or not. It's part of the business of cooperation. We've got important signals going on during development. So during development, cells are sticking together, and then they're making decisions like, should I be a liver or should I be a kidney? And the way they have to do this is they talk to each other and they recruit their neighbors. And they say, okay, I'm going to be a liver. All my neighbors around you here, you're supposed to be livers too, liver cells too. So let's get, out, get together and cooperate and build a, a, an organ. And if any other cell around there happens to want to switch on the kidney genes, uh, we'll boot him out or tell him very strongly that he has to switch. <laughs> but it requires communication. So we've got cell-cell communication going on all over the place. Now, these are functions that we think of as going on in us, all right? We're multicellular. What about quantiflagellates? They're single-celled. They don't have to do that stuff. They all have this, this free life just floating around independently, each cell doing its own thing. Uh, so you think, well, this is something new that has evolved in us. And here's a surprise. It's not new. That quantiflagellates have a lot of the machinery that are involved in this process. For instance, I'll mention just one example here. Uh, there's a protein that was thought to be characteristic of multicellular organisms, of multicellular animals, and that's a receptor tyrosine kinase. It makes you sound smart when you say these polysyllabic biological terms, doesn't it? Anyway, receptor tyrosine kinase, what it is is basically it's a protein that sits on cell surfaces and it binds to proteins in the neighborhood, so it's one of those communication agents, and then on the inside it's got something called the tyrosine kinase, which sticks phosphate groups on other proteins and initiates a cascade of activity. So it's, a, it's, it's one of these cells that are involved in communication. It's getting signals from other cells, and it's telling the nucleus, telling the DNA, what it's supposed to do. So this is what receives a signal, for instance, that, oh, my neighbors are all liver, liver cells, so I'm going to activate these proteins, which will turn on liver genes, and we'll all be happy, and this will be a good neighborhood. We'll settle down and, and raise a family right here. So that's what, that's what this is for. Where did that come from, you might ask? Well, it turns out, Quantiflagellates have receptor tyrosine kinases. It kind of blew a few people's minds way back when because receptor tyrosine kinases were thought just to be found in animals, multicellular animals. This is a characteristic of multicellular animals. Quantiflagellates are protists, they're not multicellular, yet they've got it. Uh, when they've analyzed this in some more detail, what they've discovered is an interesting de history for this particular protein. How did you get this little protein? Well, if you look in plants and if you look in fungi, you find that they have uh, tyrosine kinases. So they have the proteins that do that phosphorylation trick, and they're floating around inside the cell. And they have this other protein that sits on the surface called an epidermal growth factor. So it's a protein that's sitting on the surface and receives signals, but they're not tied together. And somewhere in the last common ancestor of quantiflagellates and us metazoans, there was an accident, a little glitch in the duplication of this gene, and it ended up fused. This is like peanut butter and chocolate, okay? <laughs> Once upon a time, peanut butter and chocolate came together, and what you got was something new. 
a brand new protein that can do some interesting new things in communications between cells. So now cells can have this little receptor on the surface that can recognize their neighbors and can initiate a bunch of changes on the inside. And all these wonderful new f features could then evolve. This is just one step in all the features that we evolved, but of course it arose in a single-celled protist.